Hello everyone and welcome back to our Moneyball series with Paris FC. It is the transfer episode, it is the best episode of the season. I'm going to go through all of our, our transfers, going to try and buy our stats for this year. We're going to show you what the stats are going to be and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, the one thing about this season is we don't actually have much money to spend right now. So the first thing we're actually going to do is actually offer some players out to see what we can get to spend. And at the same time, we'll obviously be taking the average of the three teams at the top of the league last year. So we're taking PSG, Paris FC and Marseille's uh, stats. We're going to be taking obviously each position, taking all their stats up, adding them all together, then dividing them by three as we have done in previous years. So that's what I'm going to do right now is I actually haven't done the, done the spreadsheet calculations just yet. So I'm going to do that right now. And while I'm doing that, I'm actually going to offer some players out to see what we can get for transfer money to spend. So you're going to join me back in a few days' time when we actually start that process. Now, looking at the squad early on, I'm going to probably offer out all four of the strikers. And the reason is that although clearly Mirez probably isn't quite going to be as good as Kaufman and Preka long term, it doesn't have as much potential because of his age and just and that kind of stuff, right? So that would be the most logical player to sell in terms of like get rid of him, get a few million in, maybe add another backup striker or something like that. But in terms of his actual like stats, his value for money in his stats is actually really, really good. And there's not much between him and Kaufman and Preka at all. So I'm actually going to offer all three of them up because selling Kaufman for 15 million might be a better value for money transfer out than selling Mirrors for two or three. Do you know what I mean? So that's that's what I'm looking at right here, especially when selling Kaufman for that amount of money could allow me to buy three first team players across the squad and have somebody else like Mirrors playing who does a very similar job, to be quite honest with you. And I, I'm more open to selling Kaufman than Preka because Kaufman plays on that left striker role, but but we'll see what comes back, Rob. We'll see what comes back. I've got to remember, though, to change their playing time status back to, like, first team after we don't sell them because I keep forgetting to do that with certain players, which I think doesn't help their morale and maybe the valuation sometimes. So we'll see what happens there. In terms of other high-value players to sell, De Costa is just... I'm not interested in selling De Costa at all. Christensen is wanted by Nottingham Forest. So Christensen, for me, is like a absolute no for me in terms of players out. I don't want to sell Christensen at all. But if I was to find a good centre-back for like a million pounds who's transfer listed or even on a free transfer, who I think is going to be very similar to him, then maybe it becomes like bringing in a replacement for him who's got very similar stats on a free transfer and then buying a wing-back is better than just keeping Christensen, for example, right? Something like that. Hadjam's worth loads of money again. I'm going to offer Hadjam out. I almost guarantee you he'll get no offers again. I don't know why. I think his valuation just must be out of whack with what teams perceive his valuation to be at. So, and there isn't too many of the players that's worth a lot of money. Yeah, so there we go. Right, so what I'll do now then is I'm going to do these calculations. We're going to offer some players out and you'll join me back in probably the first week of June and we'll see what we manage to, manage to do. Okay, so we didn't actually do the end of season review last time. So we're going to do that right now. Um, yeah, we're going to go through it first. And I'll tell you the players I've been able to sell or at least get offers for so far. So the new arrivals, let's see what the uh, the old fans and board thought. Uh, the Calcum, they liked a lot. It was a good, a good signing. Like, I think one thing to remember that him and Mirez did score a similar amount of goals. Calcum did play more matches, but he played against better teams, whereas Mirez played a lot of like uh, like French Cup matches, that kind of stuff, right? So he, that's why he got his goal so high. To cost a second, to cost was a really good signing. What did we sign him for in the end last season? Three million, yeah. That was a really good signing, I think. Preka was, was really good. Not quite sure what's happened here with some of these uh, these names appearing next to the names, but okay. Christensen was a B plus, and Dai was a B minus. I think and Dai was a really good signing, probably the best for like something that's not going to be uh, recognised in this for being like an A plus. Average rating wasn't above a seven, but and Dai was a really good transfer, and for me, like the box box field role is quite an important role, and there's no part of me whatsoever that's looking to replace him in that position. I'm quite happy with him. It's everything else around it that I think is more of the. The problem. Jensen gets a C plus. I think he's better than that. Mensa was an A. Okay, they think he's an A. Samuel was an, a B. Correa was a C. Nunez was a C. Prevo was a B. Okay. The results, the uh, board and the media, everybody's quite happy with that. Nice. Moments to remember. If I've no win in the league, biggest one was 9 in the Europa Conference League. And goal of the season was apparently in Derso. Finances have all gone up, which is good for us. Obviously, we need that to be happening. We're going to go up again because we're going to be getting the Champions League money this year. And then Preka, Kaufman, De Costa, and Dian De Urso are your, your highest shirts sold. Team of the season then, that's pretty much what we had. They got that right, I would have said there. Not the right way around in the back three, but apart from that, pretty good. Maybe the left wing back should be different. 
Accolades, and there we go. Fans player of the season was Kaufman. Young player of the season was also Kaufman. I really hate it when it goes to 24-year-old. Signing of the season was Kaufman. Goal of the season to Urso. Took goal scorer was Kaufman. Most sister Costa. Most player of the match was Kaufman. Harvest Savage rating was Kaufman, which is interesting. Thought we thought we'd have somebody higher than that, to be honest. Most assists in a season went to the Costa. Most clean sheets in the season went to Nuruddin. Worst if they went to Samuel with two red cards and twelve yellows, and some other ones there as well. And they have it. Some uh, some nice little things at the end of our dynamic manager timeline there going into next season. And that is your end of season review. Now, in terms of players out, I have settled on. I'm not settled on actually selling Preki yet. We've got two of us like 15 million for him. Now, Kaufman, I got eight and a half million for, right? Which sounded like an okay deal considering we managed to sign him for 1.4. But then I managed to get five straight up for Mirez. Like, five straight up. Now, if he does actually go to Olympiacos, that's by far the better transfer right now because I think that Mirez has no kickbacks on him because he was a free transfer, right? He has no kickbacks whatsoever. And that's a good thing in his contract. Okay, so 25% of it goes to him. But but uh, in terms of Kaufman, I'm pretty sure 50% of the next sale goes to his club. So it's almost the same amount of money. But I feel like the... So I think selling Mirez is better because Mirez at the moment is at the highest part of his valuation. I think next season, he's going to probably play slightly less matches anyway. And he, he may just come down a bit and then he ends up being not worth anything anyway. So I just think that right now, it's probably the better one when it's that close. If Kaufman's bid would have been 12 million, 13 million, I would have let Kaufman go instead. But we didn't get that. We got the five for Mirrors, which is fine. I'm undecided on Pika. It's going to come down to what we think we can bring in because 15 million is pretty good for a player that we signed for 4 million as well, you know. So we'll see what happens, right? In terms of the stats that we're going to be bringing in. So I'll just briefly run through them for you so you've got them on the screen and you can at least then screenshot this or pause the video if you want to copy these down yourselves. So we've got, uh, for the strikers, what stands out here? Shot and target ratio of 50% is pretty good. The goals are, the goals feel like they're a bit lower this year, are they? Extra performance of 6.5, okay. Still, I think 5 is what is really the one we're looking at, but 6.5 seems pretty good. As you can see, if we looked at 5, it would be above Kaufman, who we want to slightly improve on if we can. But it's still below the other two strikers who seem to do pretty well for their teams. So maybe Milik didn't do that well, but he was the you know the striker for the third team, of course. Conversion ratio of 21%. That was pretty close across the three players. Shot on target ratio. Kaufman are by far the worst. Doubles per 90. You get quite a big, nice difference there. You've got Mbappe, who's a pacey and behind striker on 3.05. You've got Kaufman, who's like uh, more of an in-between sort of player that can link up camera in behind, can do the channels, can do a bit of everything. He's on 1.75. So he's on 1.61. And you've got Milik, who's a more of a target man type of striker on 0.89. You, you can really see the difference in types of strikers looking at the dribbles per 90 start there. Okay, looking at the uh, the tens. Open play key passes of 1.4. Expected assists of 0.24. Looking at progressive passes of 2.7. Dribbles per 90 of 1.69. That seems, it still seems fairly low, but I suppose if the progressive passes and the open play key passes are good, that's the most important thing. So for us then, tackle win ratio of 77%. Pass completion 85 Progressive passes per 95.8. Uh, yeah, I mean, and Dai is by far the worst for that. Dribbles per 90, is he going to be higher on that for us? 1.63, yeah, he's the highest for that. So he doesn't get as many passes in, but he does dribble a lot more, which is interesting. They complement each other pretty well, these players, the three of them. Like, a couple of them are more passing type. Our one's more of like a dribbler, so that offsets that a little bit. So it just brings up the averages and evens it all back out quite a bit, which is what this is all designed for, really. In the air as well, you've got Fabian, who's got 69%, which is really good. Gerson's 59, which is still pretty good. And then Andai's at 40, which is at the lower end of what you'd want. So, but it's still pretty decent, though. So that's, again, good. Nice little uh, evening out of the stats there. Wingbacks, first thing we'll look at is dribbles per 90. And that's going to be 4.1. Okay, Correa, our own wingback, brings that down quite a bit. Hakimi and Klaus... At both I and this is probably a good point to share with you. I've got a few tactical recreations that I'm doing right now off camera that I quite like. And they're gonna probably get introduced into this series more than the Burton one, because the Burton one, the team is developing towards the tactic, and that's a no signing save, right? So that one's sort of set. But this one isn't. Now, I've got a couple of really interesting ones. A couple of them, one of them in particular, is quite a famous uh, defensive recreation of a team that upset the odds a little bit in a big memorable win as well so it'd be a brilliant sort of like Dave versus Goliath money ball versus money bags big underdog versus the uh, the favorite kind of tactic to use and there's another one that's just pure pure beautiful football but we would it would take us a little bit longer I think to be able to compete with PSG because we'd be playing such an expansive open game so I'm not quite sure which way to go but like I said this is probably going to be the last season that we use the three at the back system for the whole season, if I'm honest. 
It'll either be that towards the end of this season, we start to change or we'll go the whole season with it this season. The next season is the one that we change. But either way, in the next two seasons, we're going to see a change to a back four system in some form. I'm just not sure which one it is going to be just yet. See, if this was like a stream series while streaming it, what you would see is me chuck the tactic in for a few games here and there just to see how it plays. And then uh, and go off a gut feeling based on that, which can end up... With the money ball save, you can end up very rapidly changing tactic because if you've done pretty well with one so far, but you're looking to get progress, it's often you can end up finding yourselves going a, a step backwards because you're you're buying something completely different. Like if I was to change to a back four um, tactic that I use wingers for, and I use proper wingers in those in those positions with pace, acceleration, dribbling, that kind of thing, those players are very very expensive, very expensive, very hard to get, as I found in previous money ball saves. So. That's the one thing that's disappointing about having to use it. But in my recreations, I could probably get away with not using traditional wingers in those wide areas all the time. So that might make up for it. Who knows? And anyway, back to our current players. So yeah, look to dribbles per 90. Cross completion is very low on Hakimi. Uh, progressive passes. Let's look at that. Pretty high across the board. Tackle ratio is pretty consistent. Head on ratio is terrible for Correa. Better for the two lads. So there you go. Center backs. First thing I'm going to look at is my tackle win ratio. I'm going to look at that first. 75, head on ratio 82. Okay. Progressive passes per 90. We're looking at 4.9. Open play key passes per 90, 0.35. It feels pretty hard that for a center back. You see, Ferrarese is the one that's dragging it all up and is uh, playing on the side of a back three, right? That's uh, that's good though. It evens it out a little bit more, which, uh, which is interesting. Okay. Right then, that's our stats anyway, for those of you that wanted to follow along with, with that. So let's move on now to looking at who we buy. So what we'll do now is you'll come back and join me back in the actual game and we will look at the players we've managed to find so far and the budget. I'm still going to wait in probably another week. You'll probably join me around the second week of June maybe when I've had a chance to like sell some players and see what budgets we've got to deal with because yeah, it's going to dictate a lot on that what we can really afford to do. I'm probably going to look at some some players that are transfer listed that have got these stats or have their contract expiring coming up see what really good value is out there because that might be, enable me to make better judgments on who to sell and for what price um yeah like preek for example so i'll see you in a little bit anyway for for that right here we go then we're going to find out if psg have won the champions league remember there was two things that we didn't want them to do one was to go undefeated they managed to do that sadly and they were in the champions league final this year playing against napoli to win that's all they had to do is beat napoli did they do it and the answer is no. PSG, the ultimate bottlers, have bottled it in the final against Napoli. Obviously, we're neutral, of course. We're absolutely not neutral. They lost to them in Munich. And that is yet another year that PSG still haven't won the Champions League. Now, we're both in the Champions League. Don't forget, we could beat them and be the first team in Paris to win the Champions League. Now, wouldn't that be something? PSG have got wait yet another year. And Messi's retiring. Oh, it's all falling apart over there. Made of sand, their empire is. Right, I'll see you in a few more, few more weeks. By the way, I always forget to show this because it always ends up in that period where I'm not showing you what's going on. But but the last two years has been the club's highest finish ever. So finishing seventh in the top division last year was the club's highest finish ever in its history. And obviously this year finishing second is as well. So just so you know, that is the high watermark of the club's history so far. Oh, look at that. Team of the season. That's not biased, is it at all? PSG everywhere, except for Christensen, who's ruined it. So good luck, Christensen. Ruin the clean sweep. Okay, I've won manager of the season. Rightly so, might I add as well. I should have won it last season. But that was uh, that was really good. One bit of news to bring you. So Mamdi Kate is our youngster who I think could be a really good player, to be honest. He could be really good, especially in three or four years' time. But I feel like in three or four years' time, I could buy somebody that's as good as he's going to be. Um, or it's going to be close. It's a risk. It's going to be a risk. He's going to potentially become like a, a wonder kid or at least a very decent player. But I can offer him out now for like a 3.9 million transfer up front with, uh, what is it? It's 3.9 going up to uh, five and a half together, then 40% profit the next sale. So I think from a moneyball perspective, because we don't know how good he's going to be and we sort of need the money right now, I think, to compete, I think it's right to let him go. Um, like, like I've always said, like ev nearly every type of save in FM that you can see, whether you're doing it yourself or content creators, is there's always an element of focusing on the youth. What I quite like about this save is that it's one of the few saves that doesn't and it's more about trying to buy the stats of the players, right? So... That's also why like, I'm happy to, to sort of take the risk and let him go because it's more about trying to buy the players and buying the stats for the players and, and then developing the story from there rather than developing youth prospects. So yeah, I'm tempted to take that. We'll see what happens if he accepts it. But, yeah, let's see what happens. Okay, so strikers, there's nobody early on from the exact stats we were looking at. So let's drop a few of these here. Okay, so Walid Chadira plays in the Italian Serie CC and he scored 20 goals in 36. He was quite early on the list, actually. And what's interesting is he's actually scored goals in every season so far in the save, which is which is pretty good. Um, he's going to be, in fact, for me myself, out the way for this now. 
Chidera, yeah, he looks he looks pretty good. He looks like he could be quite a good striker. Is he going to take us to the next level? No. But he could be a nice, useful backup on a free transfer because his contract's also up. So that's what he is going to be looked at for. Okay, Victor Boniface has appeared as well on the list. He looks like he could be a good shout. Scored pretty good across the board. Wasn't great on his conversion ratio. I've had to lower that quite a bit, which is why he's only appeared right now. But he's going to get scouted. Right, so I actually just spent time going through every single playable league and looking at players and seeing if there's any value for money anywhere. A couple of players I've scouted, but the only player that I've seen so far that's consistently shown up for the last couple of years and will be a good signing is Aziz Yukubu. Last year he was good. This year, they've only just started the league in, in Norway, but he's going to have another good year by the looks of it. I think his contract's up at the end of the year, is it? Yeah, it still is. So we can get him for a discounted rate. We can't get him on a free just yet because the contract actually expires in December. But I'm going to try and get him for as cheap as I can. I don't want to risk leaving it too late to try and get him on an actual free transfer than him going to somebody else or signing a new contract anyway. And his valuation then skyrocketing. So, like, I would be really happy with him being my backup striker. Basically doing the Mirez role. But rather than being, like, the the backup, like, Mirez for Kaufman's side, he'd be for maybe Preka's side. Preka rejected his offers that he had on him. So that's uh, slightly disappointing that he rejected those the money that it was going to be and then i couldn't really get anything close back for him so i'm just going to keep free he'll be with us for this year i'd love to know how good he really is in the air it doesn't say that he's really weak in the air just because he's left footed right and we use our like big striker on the left i was just thinking could i get like eight to ten million for kaufman and then play pre on the left and bring somebody else in to be like the pacey in behind one but yeah, I, I don't know, because it doesn't really say. His head one ratio is 44%, which is substantially less than Calvin, but he's getting the ball on a different side of the pitch and in different zones for us all the time. So I don't know how much we can compare him directly to Kaufman. But there we are. Okay, and we're on to number 10s now. Okay, we actually have some options early on for this. I think it must be Mbappe that really makes the strikers so far out of range that it always starts off with nobody. But at least in the 10 position, we've got a few players to look at right off the bat. Okay, Rodrigo Garo here. Now, he has got 24 starts in the Argentine League. He's got eight and assisted five, which is pretty impressive. It's a South American or non-EU slot, rather, isn't it? That we're going to have to use up. His conversion ratio is slightly low. But apart from that, he looks quite good across the board. So I'm going to scout him because he's obviously a good player. And he's quite cheap, which is the crucial thing. So we're going to scout him and see how that comes back. Same for Jacob Larson here, but he's obviously not going to be non-EU. But um, I'm not quite sure how much he's going to be because that's a big gap on his transfer value. 650 grand to 9.4 million is quite a big gap. His wages are pretty high, unlike Rodrigo. Right, we've got a couple of options there. I'm actually happy with that because I'm not planning on selling my current number 10 anyway. So we'll take those two options, with the ones we've already got on the shortlist, and that should be enough for this season. Let's move on now to pivot players. Okay, so essential field players then. Quinton Merlin has appeared, like, straight away. I think I took down one thing. Quinton Merlin plays in our own league, which is great. Now, he's played as a fullback, so he's got our central field stats, but in the fourth position. So again, we're going to scout him. We'll go onto the list. I have to factor that in a little bit, the fact that he played left back to get the stats, but he did get the stats. So he's going to get scouted. He plays for a team that got relegated. He's available for quite cheap. Looks very, very good value for money. And he'll probably be playing central field for us this season. What a player. And like, he's not fast, according to the scouts or whoever's looked at him. So I just think he goes into a pivot role for us and goes in as a starter. Looks pretty good. Alexander Dukic here, you know, he's quite aggressive for central field player. He's got breaks offside trap, which is interesting. But again, he's well across the board. He's not bad in the air for a slightly smaller player, well, actually six foot. But he's got 84% tackle win ratio, which is really high. And he's an aggressive, more attacking central field player. So he could be a pretty good backup box to boxer for, uh, for Indai. So yeah, let's bring him in. Okay, going to move on to wingbacks now. Okay, so Jordan Latomba plays in our league. He's currently wanted by some decent clubs in our league, actually, as well. The border went on loan, apparently. Uh, he's going to get scouted. We can't see too much of him because nobody's really seen anything of him, even though he plays in our league. If I click on him, there's just nothing on the scout report at all. So we're going to scout Jordan, see what he comes back with. I think I found the one. Bright Osei Samuel. Turkish Super League. Now, didn't appear... Again, because I think he had quite low open by key passes. I think it was 1.5 at the start. Now we're down to like whatever I've got it set to now. I've uh, got it down to like 0 0.5. Now, he looks really good. His dribbles per 93, which is high, which is what we're looking for. His cross completion is 15. That's okay. I just think that tackle with is 70%. 70% in the air. Like, if I look at his stats across the board, the only thing that's low is that. Everything else is good. And his contract is up at the end of the season. Again, those are the kind of things that we need to go for us. I've just been looking for left wing backs now for a good few minutes and i don't see too many yeah i don't see too many options so the 
the left wing back that was signed as like a CDM, I think he's likely going to be signed and he might have played wing back. He might have to teach him to work on his uh, quickness. Hope that he gets like quick enough to be an explosive wing back as well with a view to making him a left back in a back four. Maybe we do that. And then we could either, we need to sell either Hadjem or Mensah if we do bring him in then, in that case, is what we'd have to do. Well, looking at centre-backs there, and the first players that come up, the first two are our own players. So there you go. That's uh, that's interesting. Let's see what else we can get here. Here we go then. Top of the list is Benoit Badiashile. Not sure I could pronounce this exactly, but uh, yeah, we're going to scout him. He looks pretty good. He hasn't started the most games, but it looks right. His wages are a little high. Mies Hill goes as well. Looks pretty good. Like we're not necessarily looking for a starting level player here. We could take a backup because we've got pretty good centre-backs as it is. Uh, Riquile looks pretty good in the Portuguese Premier League here across the boards. Again, good stats. Good in the air, which is always important. We've noticed that players that are good in the air that, and that can play from the back are normally just good on their own, regardless of the tackle win ratio. That seems to be the way to go, which is not how I like it because I like to have a high tackle win ratio. But from the stats, that's what we've learned so far at centre-back. Okay, that's going to conclude our like search using the traditional means. I'm just going to look at players that are transfer list that will have their contracts coming up to being expired and then cross-referencing their stats manually with what stats we've uh, looked at to search for. Okay, after a long, long period of searching for players, I'm going to continue through now and we'll come back later in the transfer. I had some interesting players to look at. I tried to look for a goalkeeper. The only one I've really got that I think is going to be of note is... Is it Malison here? It's Malison, yeah. A guy that's already on my shortlist from previous searches. He's Brazilian, so the only concern is it goes against one of, being one of our like non-EU players, right? But if he's a massive upgrade as a goalkeeper, is it worth it? That's the question. I guess I'll find out the answer pretty soon. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens anyway. I'll see you in a few weeks, and let's see who I managed to bring in. And welcome back, everybody. It is not a new day. It is the same day for me, just later on in the evening. As I'm recording, as I'm recording this, it does look a little different. Somebody asked me if I dyed my hair. I don't. Sometimes I just have a light on behind the other light when it's late at night, and that's what you can see. So yeah, I'm sure you wanted to know that anyway. Anyway, let's get to the uh, the episode here and the transfers in. So starting off, we have Enzo Leopold. He looked a really good pivot player that I thought as the more aggressive attacking one, and he comes in for a grand total of 750 grand. So quite a cheap one, potentially the backup for Ndai. That was my sort of idea for him. And I think he's going to be slightly worse than Ndai. So I think it's a really good signing. And he's also, he can play wing back. So he could play there as an emergency for us. Isn't the quickest though. So probably an emergency that would be. Aziz Yakubu comes in after the last two years of searching for him and trying to get him in. He comes in for 2.2 million pounds with his contract up at the end of the year. There is no sell-on fee release clause or any sell-on fee kickback to him. It was 2.2 million. Not all straight up, 2.2 million. But if we sell him, we get all the money into the club, which is which is good. Mies Hilgers. Mies Hilgers is a ball-playing defender from the Dutch League. He looks like a good, solid fourth-choice centre-back to be there, to play on the side of the back three, mainly for us if we need him to come in. I think he'll be a, a decent player, just a backup player, really, and cost us £2.9 million. Quite expensive for a centre-back, but for a backup centre-back, but it's where we're at, really. It's the price we have to pay. Jacob Brun Larson. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I may have forgotten that I'd already signed Jose Samuel as a wing-back. So I'd signed Larson thinking, oh, what a great signing that is at wing-back. Yeah, £2.9 million for a player that's... I don't know if he's going to play or not, really. It's going to be a, a toss-up between him and Jose Samuel. The one good thing is that when we do eventually go to a back four system and play with wingers, both Larson and Jose Samuel could both play as a winger. So one of them could play full back, one of them could play on the wing. So it is already one of those first transfers of us transitioning to that back four system if we need to. His valuation is pretty high, actually. We spent 2.9 million on him. So there you go. Oliver Christensen comes in as a goalkeeper. Now, you may have noticed he was on the uh, shortlist, or I might have scouted him, actually. Maybe he was on the shortlist at the time. But I had, uh, is it Malison, Mike on the Brazilian goalkeeper we're going to sign anyway. I was going to sign him. And Christensen was the only other goalkeeper I looked at with pretty good stats last year playing for Norwich. And the only thing that put me off Christensen was that his valuation was already at like 5 million. And, you know, for a championship player, I thought if I tried to sign him, it says 5, it's going to be 10 because it's an English football, right? But I managed to get him for 1.9 million and 50% of the next sale. Now, the reason I did it for this transfer is... If he's good, I don't intend on selling him for quite a few years. So that 50% shouldn't really affect us, not in the short term anyway. And if I do sell him, it'll be a point where, I don't know, the money's not going to matter too much to us at that point. We should have enough to, to compensate. Now, Oliver Christensen, I have signed once for an FM, in FM23 actually. When FM23 first came out, I did a, a Twitch series with Hart playing a low block defensive style of football. And in that save, I did sign up Oliver Christensen. However, 
I cannot remember for the life of me whether he was a genuinely good goalkeeper or if he was just good for the SPL. I can't remember which way around it was. So he could be good, he could not. In any case, the reason I signed him was that he got the stats for us. That's why he comes in. He had good saves, how good save ratio, which are the two things that I look at first with a goalkeeper, as well as him playing at a decent level, of course. So we'll see. Maybe he's good, maybe he's not. But he comes in anyway. Victor Boniface comes in as our backup big striker on the left-hand side. So he comes in for 2.9 million and will be a backup for Kaufman or at least compete with Kaufman for a position. Maybe he gets in the first team, who knows? But he comes in for, yeah, 2.9 million. And who, who knows? He could be a really good signing for us. I'm not sure that's good value for money yet. His stats are really good. He was good in the air. He scored a lot of goals last year. It was the first year that he'd really scored though in the save. So maybe I've overspent a little, but he's a backup. So there we are. Now, in terms of players out... We sold Talby for 2.8 million. So effectively, we sold Talby and replaced him with somebody for the same money, but somebody who's younger in the back three. Laundog went on a free. Nea went on loan to get him off the wage bill a little bit. And Hadjam's gone for 1.5 million. In addition to that, Nuruddin is leaving for 3.5 million. Nunes is leaving for 850 grand. Correa is leaving for 1.4 million. Now, Correa, I didn't want to sell. I'm only selling him because I accidentally bought two right wing backs, basically, is what happened there. Uh, so there we go. Cater's leaving for yes, 3.9 million. So yeah, I'm a bit sad about that in some ways, but I think it's the right thing to do for the save. So Cater goes, hopefully enjoys his football over in Korea. De Urso leaves for 450 grand. Suxum leaves for 150 grand. And Mirez leaves for 5 million pounds, all happening tomorrow, incidentally. Still got a lot of money left to spend. Right this second, I'm still looking at a centre-back and maybe a striker still. Like, I'm not too sure if Boniface is going to be good enough. I mean, maybe he is, because him and Kaufman have got very similar ratings here by the old coaches, so who knows? But goalkeeper's set now for this season. Four of the centre-backs are set. I still need at least one more, maybe even two. So yeah, we still need to bring in a centre-back. We still need left wing-back, a starting level one as well at that. Maybe a striker, but definitely centre-back still, maybe even two, and definitely wing-back. That's three players that need to come in. We've got enough at CDM, potentially. I still want to get our friend Merlin to be our sort of starting CDM, maybe move Samuel to the backup role. And then he can also play as an emergency left wing back as well. Philip Clements in the squad because I can't get rid of him, basically. That's the only reason that Clements even in the squad right here. And then you've got Leopold and Dijer, two box to boxes. Samuel and Merlin is the, the two pivots that are going to hold. That's good. Two keepers there. Four set of backs there. Add two more in. Looking all right. Might need a backup 10 as well to come in. Yeah, we do need that as well. So that is what I'm going to continue with over the next few days here. And you'll see me again probably around the uh, towards the last week of July. But if I was to ask you who you thought PSG might buy in the summer, one name that wouldn't be on your bingo card would be Lloyd Kelly from Bournemouth. So that's who they've signed, £21.5 million. Okay, then in today's episode, we're going to finish off by playing PSG in the Jeux de Champion, which I think means, which is the French equivalent of the Community Shield which is uh, effectively what it's going to be there against PSG. So we get a chance to play them again at a neutral venue. Can we beat them this time? We haven't beaten them yet on the on the channel in the series. In fact, we've not even drawn against them yet, so let's see what happens. And then we'll finish off by playing Monaco in the first league game of the season. But before we get to either of those two things, let's wrap up the final transfers of the transfer window. So we bring in Benoit Badiashili. He comes in as our centre-back. He looks pretty good. He cost us 1.8 million with half of the next sale going to, to Monaco. There's anywhere we could get him for quite cheap. He's on a lot of wages, but he's obviously a really good centre-back. Had good stats from last year. He did only just make the cut for my stats because he had eight starts and 16 sub-appearances. If he would have started another two games less than eight, I don't think I would have signed him because there's too many sub-appearances for his stats. But he just made the cut on the stats. The stats were good. And most importantly, they were very, very good value for money. So 1.8 million is good for us. Rodrigo Garo. Now, I'm denied about him. Now, we eventually didn't end up having an issue with non-EU players. So he comes in £2 million from the Argentine Premier Division. Looks really good. He's going to be our backup number 10. Big, just because last year, Da Costa did such a good job. I don't really want to replace him. I want to give Da Costa a chance to carry on. Garrow's going to be a backup number 10. And also, he could play pivot as well if we need him to. Osei, Samuel Cummins on a free chance. We already knew that, but there you are. And then last but not least, Quinton Merlin. Now, Quinton Merlin is the left wing back that had CDM stats for us effectively, right? So, Quinton Merlin's going to play... Wing back for us initially, he's learning to play as a pivot, as a CDM, and he's working on his quickness, because apparently he's not the quickest. So he's going to spend a year sort of doing the two jobs, depending on who's available, really. Like, if my CDMs are not performing well, and Mensa is still good at wing back, maybe we play Mensa wing back, we play Merlin CDM. 
if the CDMs are playing really well, maybe we just keep Merlin at wing back. You know, the left wing back isn't as important for pace, dribbling, acceleration as it is on the right side because the right side is where you've got the time and the space for them to do that. On the left, he, we can afford him to be slightly better at progressing the play, not being maybe as quick. So we'll see. Long term on both of those, if we go to a back four, he could be easily a full back in a back four, right? So it's all looking, it's all looking pretty good for us at this stage. And in terms of players out. See all the players there that we said before. The only additional player that's gone is Samuel, the youngster that we had from Belgium. Didn't really work out. We got him on a free transfer. We've sold him for 200 grand. So there you are. Now, our projection has gone to like 10 million in the red. And the reason for that is I actually got him to accept a request for me to upgrade the training facility. So that's why that is there. Transfer budget is looking very worrisome. I'm expecting that to change if we do well in Europe this year, which is... The... I'd say the Champions League is the priority of getting as far as we can because... If we're not going to win the league, we should finish in the top four. So the best thing for us is to get as far as possible into the Champions League to try and get as much money as possible to make sure that the transfer budget is as big as possible, if you follow what I mean. And yeah, prioritise the Cups if we're not in a title race. If we're in a title race, that makes things difficult. But for now, Champions League and Cups is the biggest thing for us. And that is going to be your squad for the season. As you can see, it's a really small squad. It's only pretty much two players for every position, apart from centre-back. There's only five, and we need six to have two players. It's quite a small squad. So your first team for the cup final against PSG is going to be, and it's the first cup final against PSG as well, Christensen in goal with Badishili, Christensen and Jensen across the back. We've got two Christensens close together here, one with the K, one with the C. Merlin and Samuel wingbacks with Samuel and Ndai as pivots, De Costa as the 10, Pariku Yacuba up front. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. Only five different players in the starting 11, which is quite impressive for me in a money ball save. I normally change the entire 11, so a bit of continuity there. Again, early thoughts on what could change. I think the pivots could change quite easily. I'm, I can see Leopold coming into wing uh, into centre defensive midfield. I could even see Larson getting to the starting 11 somehow. Now that could be in multiple different forms. That could be like a straight sort for, say, Samuel. It could be as a striker. It could be as a 10. Not totally sure on that just yet. And even Garrow could get in as a, as a pivot player as well. Those are the options there. It's nice that Farrazi is such a solid, dependable centre-back. And he's now our backup. So anytime we have an issue in the back three, Farrazi goes in there. And we know how good Farrazi is and how reliable he is. That's that's quite reassuring to have. And that moves Hilgers down to our number five centre-back, which feels a bit better, doesn't it? That feels a little bit better that way around. So nice progression of the squads. Looking good. Let's get into the season. Let's get into the Paris Derby against Paris Saint-Germain and let's hopefully get our first trophy of the series potentially right here. Keep forgetting there's a trophy to play for. Let's see how we do. Pink kit in the cup final. Come on, we've got to win this. Pink kit in the cup final. Assistant manager says, nobody expects us to get results so you just go out there and enjoy playing without any pressure on you. That is not the tone of the team talk assistant manager. What are we doing here? But there's us in our famous pink kit. What are they going to play? They've got no Messi now. I just noticed as well, I had a bit of a look off camera. They have spent money on absolutely nobody here. Oh, that's a beatable team. They've bought Diego Jota for like, I don't know, 100 million, I guess. They must have just signed him. Let me double check this. Yeah, they, right. They, they bought Lloyd Kelly, as we saw earlier, 20 and a half million. 17 and a half million on Matty Cash. 59 million on, on Diego Jota. And then Enzo Fernandez, 36 and a half million. Enzo Fernandez is a really good player. That's a, that's a worry. Diego Jota's decent, but is he messy? Because that's who he's replacing. I'm not too sure about those first two transfers, but there we are. And we are underway. What do you think? I'm thinking we score a goal early, go a goal up, and then it becomes difficult towards the end. That's my prediction. Is it going to be true, though? Here we go. Merlin plays it back to Badashile, plays it across to Christensen, the centre back Christensen, not the goalkeeper. Travels with it all the way to the middle of the pitch, plays it in behind. Azizu Kubu. Oh, the player that I've chased for two years has missed a clear one on one. What's he doing? Lloyd Kelly throws it. Oh, it's a penalty. Of course it is. PS, you're in a bit of trouble. Just give him a penalty. Make sure they score and win. Got to do it, haven't you, ref? Disgrace for name of the penalty. What now? They are playing some new gen goalkeeper in goal, incidentally. Somebody from their uh, their academy, I think, or young Spanish one anyway. Christensen plays it into no man's land. It's headed down. Preek is not going to get to it. Azizu Kubu might be the first sub off at half time, by the looks of it. He's done absolutely nothing in the game and missed a uh, absolutely clear one on one. And Dai's giving it away. They go through. They're going to get a score. Jota makes it two and he's onside. That new tactic that we're talking about is coming pretty soon, I think. Like, we're overachieving, don't forget. You've got to remember, we are massively overachieving, but it just feels like every time we play PSG, we haven't got, uh, we haven't got like a, a fighting chance at the moment. 
which is the most frustrating thing. Even if I get a new tactic just to play against them and European games for now, maybe that's just the way to go. And keep the normal tactic for league matches for at least the, the short time period here. Don't be a red card highlight, please. Give us a chance in the second half. Here we go. Undai. This is more like it. Samuel. Into the Costa. Slides into Preka. Preka's through. He's going to score because he's not... You he missed it. Are we going to win this? The Costa. Slides it into Aziz. Which is Yakubu. Oh, do you know what? We'll just get off the pitch. Bonnie face is on. Okay, I'm going to say what was that. Get your acts together. Merlin. The wizard with a free kick headed towards goal. And it's in. Is it onside? Badashile gets a goal. Badashile gets a header. And it's 1-1. One, one. Uh, sorry, it's 2-1. Going to take off a save, Samuel, throw on uh, lot. Going to take off a save, Samuel, throw on Larson as well. It's a free kick on the edge. This is a guaranteed goal right there, right on the wall. 3 1. What's he going to do with it? Christensen throws it short to the goalkeeper. Goes out to Larson, our new wing back. Go on, Larson. What you got for me? What you got for me? Plays it to Kaufman. Takes some touches. Whacks it to Bonnie Face at the far post. Sets it towards goal. He nearly scores from miles out, but he was offside anyway. PS, you have the ball. And Dai gets a challenge in. They're going to continue their attack. Lloyd Kelly is going to link up with Neymar to jot up or could have been a goal and it is a goal. It's 4-1. And they have it 4-1 to PSG. We'll say disappointed, I think. Yeah, that was a real shame. It was that far, the gap between us. I feel like I should start the exact same team in the next game. So apart from Yakubu, let's not do that again. Let's just go with the Calvin and Preka. Let's go with Tried and Trusted from last year up front and see how they do. Apart from that, let's go with exactly the same team and see how they go against Monaco. So I'll see you in a week for that. The good news is PSG somehow drew the first game of the season against Le Havre. So we could finish today top of the league and above Paris Saint-Germain on points. That'd be incredible, wouldn't it? What a, what a change of events. It was a big 0-0 draw in their game against, uh, against Le Havre. So we're going to today's game then against Monaco. Same team except for the strikers, like we said. And let's hope for a better performance. Assistant manager says, go out there and make the home advantage count. Okay, bring it out from the back. Play into Samuel. Back into the back three. Da Costa. Into Kaufman, into pre case He's through. Is he going to score? He does. It's 1 0. See on the replay here. So Samuel gets it, plays it back into the uh, back three. Da Costa gets it, plays a little bit of slide ball into Kaufman. Kaufman into Preka. Goes 1v1, finishes it first time. It's 1 0 to Paris FC. Came on, cover the ball. They play it across their back line. They progress forwards. They lose the ball. Bad late into Da Costa. Into Kaufman. Heads it back. And Dai gives it away again. They're going to build their attack now. Golovin. Gives it away. Oh, some crunching challenges. Borderline reds. If he'd have not got near the uh, the ball there. Preka goes through. Is he going to score? Oh, he does. The goalkeeper tries a K block and he goes past and it's 2-0. Come on. Free kick for Monaco. Whipped in. Far post headed away. What's the conclusion? This is going to be it's gonna be their chance from here. Globin. Far post. Dembele. Cross the far post again. Headed towards goal and it's in. Goalkeeper looked calamitous. Christensen's not had a great start, has he? To be fair. Merlin throws it to Calvin. Back into Merlin. Plays it across to Badashile. Back to the keeper. Christensen travels with it. Plays it behind to Kaufman, who's onside. Plays it across to Preka, headed towards goal. Probably should have been a goal. Attack continues. Merlin gets it again, swings it, crosses blocked. Doesn't even try to counter press there for some reason. Probably should have done. And they're going to go easily. Now, lads, what are we doing? We are all over the shop here. They go through, they score, it's 2 2. Highlight here again. Highlight's absolutely incredible here. There's just highlight after highlight in this game. Monaco are going to go long because they've got their ass to go with it. It'll say Samuel recovers it. Okay, let's see something from you boys on the right hand side. We need the right hand side to be slightly better here. I think Preka's offside. But the attack continues. Merlin gets it now. Swings into the Costa. The Costa over to Preka. Headed away. It's going to come down to say Samuel beats his man. Is he going to score? Plays it across. Oh, I should have played it across. Monaco highlight again. This game has just been. This game was in full of highlights. Monaco with the free kick. Goes to Matip. Over to Golovin. Is he going to get a goal? Oh my goodness, that was close. Okay, we'll say don't lose faith. Highlight here. We win the ball with Merlin now. Christensen, he has options on the right-hand side. He can travel with it. He's, oh, he, tries to play with he tries to play Samuel. It doesn't quite work out. Badashile gets it, plays it across to Merlin. Merlin again. Merlin has it, plays it to Christensen. Christensen still. To Ose Samuel now on the right-hand side. Loses the ball, wins it back. Have we got this? We still do. He gives it away again. Oh, lads, we need to be better than this. We need to be so much better than this in possession if we're going to beat PSG to a league title. Yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely getting closer and closer towards one change of tactic. It's getting to that point. I still won't do it this early in the season, but it's like there's just so many warning signs here. Merlin, Kaufman could be offside. Yeah, he's offside. Late highlight. Last ten minutes. There's a highlight here. It's gonna be a goal kick for Monaco. I have gone to the attacking version of the of the uh, the tactic. 
The attacking version of a three at the back tactic. They're through. Hugo Dory goes through. He shoots and he scores it from the fucking goal kick. Corner. Merlin towards goal. 3-3. Three, three. Finishes 3-3. Three, three. I mean, I think we're fortunate to get the draw in some ways. We did create a lot of chances in the game. There were a lot of highlights. We gave up a lot of chances as well, though. Definitely food for thought. And it's something I might start experimenting with there, like in the next few weeks. I'll play, the, I'll play this tactic probably for the rest of August. Let's see where we're at after August. And if we're clearly struggling or doing no better than we should be normally, I'll start to introduce my new tactic and we'll see where we go from there. But that is going to do the episode. What a brilliant transfer winner to go through. We've got a really good but small squad. It's really, really important to, to be aware of that. And we have played, you know, played PSG in a cup final. Then we played Monaco in a game straight after. So, I mean, it's a poor start in terms of the result, but... We'll see how it evens out. Let, let's, not, let's not panic just yet. Let's see how, how it pans out. And we'll see what we get in our Champions League group stage and that kind of stuff, right? I'm not sure what to do with that. I think that's still a few weeks away, isn't it? Deciding who we're going to get. So I'll save that for the next episode. I'll save the Champions League group stage for the next one and that kind of stuff. In terms of the next episode then, that's what we'll do because we can't see the actual schedule yet until the Champions League games are thrown in. Maybe we'll do Champions League game, a league game, then we throw in the, uh, the game against PSG at home. Maybe that should be a good little fit. We should get ourselves a bit into because it's a bit into the season then a little bit as well, isn't it? It gets us concluding the next episode nicely going into then like maybe the January one afterwards, something like that. But we'll see what happens anyway in all the uh, all the competitions. A massive thank you for me for watching the series. I appreciate all the support, all the all the comments, all the likes, all the everything you do. Whether it's Twitter, YouTube, whatever it is. Thank you very, very much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.